Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. My guest today is a British actress turned author who has appeared in television, film, radio, and on stage. She made a television debut in an episode of the popular sitcom On the Buses, before going on to star in the film version and other roles in TV and film. She appeared in Carry On England, Confessions of a Pop Performer, A Private Enterprise, Quadrophenia, Stephen Frears as The Hit, Bergerac, Minder, Birds of a Feather, The Bill, Holby City, Doctors and more. She is perhaps best known for her portrayal of Spike Dixon's love interest, April, in the popular 1980s sitcom, Heidi High. My guest has been married to Man About the House actor, Brian Murphy, since 1995, and is now a crime novelist. Today, I talked to Linda Regan. We discuss Linda's childhood, her career as an actress, her love of writing, a tragic incident, and her married life. Thank you kindly, Linda, for joining me on this Wednesday evening for your take, your life, your life story. Thank you kindly. Good to see you. And you. Yeah, and you. Very much looking forward to casting the clock back, mainly to the kind of 1970s decade and onwards, with all your television and film credits. But I kind of thought the, the best starting point was to go back to the, the kind of very beginnings, if that's okay with you, your early life. Mm, sure. You were born in, in Brixton, London. Can it you was, tell yeah. us... Can you tell us what life was like during your childhood and mainly your time spent in Bromley when your family moved when you were just five years old? Yeah, and daddy got rich. Um, well, but Brixton in those days was, um, it was just full of variety people. My, my dad was um, a variety, he, he was a comic and um, he worked in, on holiday camps, a children's entertainer and um, Punch and Judy man. Uh, Toastmaster, all sorts of things. And he became a variety agent as well, which is when we got rich and <laughs> moved to Bromley. Um, the early years, I remember very little of. I was a baby, um, as, as you know. I know that our neighbour was lovely 321 Ted Rogers, who I worked with many, many, many years later in pantomime uh, and adored. And Daddy and Ted used to work the halls doing, um, you know, their comedy act. Uh, going around in the early days trying to get noticed. Uh, we moved to Bromley. My very first job was with Daddy in the back of his Punch and Judy kit, handing up the puppets because I had I've got very little hands, so I could hand up the puppets, and I was tiny, so I could get into the kit behind him and um, pass them up at given time. And that's my um, my door into show business. You've mentioned in quite some detail about your dad and his background as an entertainer, as a showman, and you working alongside him. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pick up on your mother because I believe that she hailed from London. Can you kind of just, sorry, from Ireland? Mummy hailed from Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Well, mummy was very, mummy was very, I don't know what they saw in each other. Um, they, 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 they met at a dance hall. Daddy was working and, and mummy was out she was a nurse in London she came over from Ireland uh with Port Leash where our farm we still have a farm well I say we my cousin has a farm down there the same farm um but mummy came over to to London and became a nurse and, and she met daddy and uh, their mum was a very strict Irish Catholic and daddy was <laughs> quite good at swearing basically um uh mummy sent sent me and, and my sister to a very strict Irish Catholic convent and daddy used to love to get us out of it and take us in, in the back of the van and off to wherever he was working which I liked. I was awful at school, I was just dreadful, I was not a good student, a little dyslexic, mad as a March hare and couldn't wait to get out and consequently and then happily got expelled at, six, at 16. 
um, which is when I started my career. However, I'd worked before then as a child anyway. So that's... I was, um, was going to yeah. pick up on your schooling. You've, you've obviously mentioned about being very disillusioned by the kind of educational system and you, you've kind of briefly mentioned. And I kind of wanted to ask what was kind of the, the get out calls for you because you joined the Wor Worcester Repertory Company after Thank leaving you. school. Can you oh, um, yeah, that wasn't exactly after leaving school. There was a bit of a, um, I mean, I left school under a very dark cloud and I wanted to carry on working and being an, I wanted to be an actress, a theatre actress as well. But um, in those days, you really had to go to drama school and do all that. So I worked, I, um, I, I worked in clubs. I did stand up like daddy uh, in clubs, nicked all daddy's friends gags and um, was rather dreadful and had a, a troupe of dancers called the Yummy Girls. So worked around, uh, around clubs and stuff like that. I also did some disc jockeying and um, all the while I was auditioning for to try to get into rep to, to be taken seriously as an actress and eventually I got in I'd done some ju juvenile stuff earlier and I did a series a school series on the BBC one playing a schoolgirl, and they would just happen to be doing a play that they needed a schoolgirl in in Worcester rep and um, they phoned my agent after seeing me in the BBC series and said would I like to play the part and um, my agent very kindly and sensibly said only if you can give her some some other work some other part plays and that's how I how I got into rep so I went from rep to rep to rep to rep to rep <laughs> then because you just go, went from one rep to another and did tv in between and things like that and um, then I came to London I played the lead in a play in the West End and I went on to join the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and you know things went quite well really <laughs> considering I was a, you know a, a bit of a dumb child at school and expelled and a bit wild so um, no one more surprised than me but there you go. The rest is all history as they say. We're going to come on shortly and I'm going to talk about your career breakthroughs and you've briefly kind of discussed about your roles on the, the the West End and obviously adaptations of Shakespeare as well. But before I move on to that, I wanted to talk about your father and I wanted to ask how big an influence he was in you pursuing a career as an actress. And were your both your parents supportive over that decision? And do you think overall your experience of helping your father, who was obviously an entertainer, did that have an impact on you shaping your career decisions? Uh, I miss my father. I've, my daddy's been dead for probably, well, I've been married to Brian for 30 years, something like that. I've been with Brian 30 years. I've been married 27, 28, you forget. Um, so, and I still, daddy had died before that. So, I'm, I, so I miss him every day. He was my biggest influence in life. Um, I think he was, Daddy was a marvellous, marvellous sense of comedy, absolutely wonderful. And I used to watch him doing the Punch and Judy. And it's hard for a child to understand how that, that's in a way, is, is there's a lot of comedy in Punch and Judy. And I think I learned comedy timing from being with Daddy doing that. I also did a, a, a oh, I worked with Daddy in, in an act, a comedy act. Um, and yes, he taught me a lot. I, I'm, I learned a lot from all his friends as well, but yes, he's certainly my biggest influence in life. Um, I think mummy would have liked me to have been a nun or um, a, a nurse. <laughs> I think things that were the um, furthest thing away from what was going to happen in my life, really. Um, but yeah, daddy was my very, very, very strong influence. We've spoken about your childhood, your family background. We've spoken about your parents and your particular fondness for your father. We, we move on to your career in show business. And I wanted to, you kind of briefly mentioned this already, but I wanted to ask how that acting career break, how did that come about? And what was your first paid role? And can you tell us about how your television debut 
in the ITV sitcom on the bus has happened. And what was that, what was that experience like? Um, what can I say? Um, what, what was the first bit of the question about, about Daddy? No, we've done Daddy's Influence. What, what, what was the first bit of the question before? before... Yeah, the, the first part was how did um, your acting career break? How did that come right. about? And what was your, your first paid role? And then I wanted to right. ask how um, the On the Buses, um, yeah. how that came sure. about, the role. Um, well, I think um, I can't. My first paid role was most definitely in the back of the Punch and Judy kit, handing up puppets and not being paid in ice cream and donkey rides. That was definitely my first paid role. I think I got two and sixpence, something like that. Um, and yeah, that was that was great fun. So, but I worked, you know, I did lots of odd things all, all the time through my life. So I couldn't really tell you what my first job was because so many of them. When you're younger, you just do sort of like. You, you don't really have parts, you just do bits and, you know, there's a bit like being a walk-on or something like that, um, but you're learning all the time. Um, on the buses, um, now I, we, we talked about Daddy, now I'm going to talk about an, uh, my very close friend, Anna Cam, who we all know has recently died, um, who played Olive in On the Buses. She was a very good friend of mine all through my life. Um, and I will miss her terribly as well. But um, yes, Anna got me, um, introduced me to, to to the director and I, I got um, I got into On the Buses. I did a small part on the buses and consequently the film. Um, uh, so I, I, I think probably I've got Anna to thank for that. Uh, I, I, and what was it like? It was great fun because they never stopped laughing, that company. They never stopped giggling. They giggled at everything. It was just you go in, in the morning, you couldn't even have a coffee without giggling. And, and I had a kiss with um, Reg Varney. And honest to God, <laughs> we couldn't do it for giggling. He's such a lovely man. They're such a lovely company. You know, they're all up there in Heaven's Bar, riding around in a bus together, drinking wine and whatever and I just wish them all well because they were just so lovely to work with and I was young very young I'm probably about 18 then um and they were just a joy complete joy do you believe that your appearance in on the buses led to many film and television appearances throughout the 1970s and what are your overriding memories from the 1970s era and which roles stand out as your favourites and why? Um, OK, so um, I don't know that I've got any favourites. Are you we're talking about television? I, could, I might have some favourite parts in, in, in the theatre. I loved playing. I played Marilyn Monroe in the story of Marilyn's life at the end of her life, when her life was going very um, kaput and downhill. Uh, and that was a, a, a absolute gift of a part for an actress. I, I loved playing that. Um, I, I loved being part. I loved being part of the company, the Royal Shakespeare Company, because I learned so much. And my kind of tutor, you, it, when you're in the company, you have somebody who takes your classes, your your workshops when you're not on stage and stuff. And my my person was David Suchet, so I was terribly lucky, and I learned so much from. David Suchet um, as an actor. So that there, there are things that definitely stand out in my mind. Um, I, I mean, I'd have to say, I'd have to say it was Heidi High that was always my favorite um, because it was the most memorable, but it, I've done, as you, you know, so many and they've all, I, I've had joy, different kinds of joy from all of them. There was a series which probably most people don't remember. It was called Harry and Kosh. It was on channel five. I played the mother of two boys. And I just adored being in that show. We, it ran for five or six years, I can't remember. And it was just the, one of the nicest companies. Uh, they, they were lovely. So everything has, you know, has its own kind of mm. memories and fondness. Obviously, I'm going to ask you about Heidi High um, very shortly in our discussion. But I kind of mm. wanted to pick up on comedy because... You've spoken of your love of comedy and you've played yeah. so many comedy roles in sitcoms and films. And we can list so many from On the Buses to 
Doctor at Large to one of the Carry On films, Carry On England, Heidi High, which you mentioned, Confessions of a Pop Performer and Adventures of a Private Eye. What, what attracted you specifically to comedy and how difficult is it to perform comedy well? And which performers or behind the scenes personnel did you most enjoy working with in those comedy roles? Well, they're all being, I have so many people that I loved working with. Um, I loved, I did a sketch with Eric Sykes when I was very young and he was just such a joy. I've had, I've had such a lucky career in that I've worked with so many great people. Um, I, you know, I may not have always been the leading light and stuff, but I work with so many great people and, you know, I, I can kind of bow to all of them. Um, a Ted Rogers was an absolute joy to what I played comedy fairy in a panto with him, although I, I have done many variety concerts with him. Um, and I love working with, I loved working with Ted Rogers. Humphrey Littleton, um, sorry, I haven't a clue. I went, when I was on the radio rep, I was asked to go down and be part of, do something in Sorry, I haven't a clue. And I was so excited, I was beside myself. Um, because I think the great, some of the greatest performers were, were down there. I mean, you know, God rest, and God bless Barry Cryer. We've lost him recently, but what a wonderful, wonderful, clever man. Um, and anyway, I go, went down to um, Radio 4 to do this. And I said, what, 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 do you have a script? What, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, actually, Linda, I wonder if you mind playing an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> I had to play an orgasm in front of all the, which was great. Well, it wasn't great. It was, it was hysterical. I just said, you know, am I going to get the next when Harry met Sally? What, um, what, yeah, what kind of research and prep goes into um, playing <laughs> that particular part then? I, I, well, I then played another one in, in Birds of a Feather. So, I mean, I was kind of the orgasm centre of the earth universe <laughs> for that year. Um, but um, because... Obviously, I I did my, I didn't mind. I was delighted. I was honoured. But um, the John Naismith, who was the producer, very kindly wrote me um, a two hander with Humphrey Littleton, where I played his nurse in an old people's home, um, and he was just a joy to work with. Again, the stories and you listen to people. You learn from all these people all the time, um, and we never stop learning. We never never stop learning. Uh, and I'm just trying to think of other people. Jack Smethurst, who's recently left us again. I worked with Jack. Um, we did a stage play. Um, I loved working with Jack. He was just a kind, delightful, wonderful man. Heartbreaking when he left us. Um, who else stands out? So many people stand out of my, my mind. T -t Tommy Cannon and Bobby Ball I toured with them for six months my god if they were listening Tommy might be listening um we had we laughed all the time we had such such fun um great and I used to watch them every night I used to stand in the wings when they were on it together and watch them because it's, it's a great lesson in comedy they're fantastic I've just worked with so many great people and thank, you know, thankfully I'm, I'm lucky that I have. And my love for comedy has come from my father and with no doubt about that, no doubt. I mean, I still do. I do a talk after lunch talks mm. um, called Acting Can Be Murder because, as you know, I now write crime novels as well as act. Um, so I, I talk about anecdotes, about things that have gone wrong. And, of course, it's all hopefully fun so it's my kind of still I'm still doing stand-up in that way which I can't let go of comedy. From your love of comedy and your fondness for looking back and reminiscing of all the people you've worked with we'll, we'll stick with a the comedy theme and one of your favourite roles which was playing the part of April Wingate in the popular sitcom back in the 1980s Heidi High what was that overall experience like? And what was it like being Spike Dixon's love interest and working with the great comedy actor, Jeffrey Holland? Well, I went into the series. I, didn't, I wasn't in it from word go. I went in it 
um, I think I came in about the fourth series or fifth, I can't remember, somewhere around there. Um, and of course, I was terrified when I came in because the, it was massive. The show was absolutely massive. It was number one everywhere you went. It was a massive, massive hit. Um, and I, I was terrified. I knew, I, I did know some of them because through my father, I knew and Paul Shane really well um, and a couple of the others I had worked with. Um, but I just thought I am going to learn so much here. And I tell you, one of the greatest people to work with, to watch for good comedy timing was Leslie Dwyer, uh, who played the Punch and Judy Man. And then, of course, Kenny Connor came in as well, who I'd worked with on the Carry On and something else. Um, and I loved Kenny. I got really well with him. He's another great, great uh, lesson in, in comedy. And uh, Jeff, I loved working with Jeff Holland. He's a dear, lovely man, very kind, very amicable, very nice to work with. Um, and, and a very, good, very, very good actor, extraordinarily good actor. Um, I... I defy anyone not to go and see his show he's got a, does a one-man show called Laurel and Hardy which um I'm sure you know about but it's absolutely breathtakingly wonderful yeah and Stan um, Stan Laurel's one of his kind of great idols I think he um yeah. he looks up to him and he's been a, a huge I guess inspiration on, on his career as a, a comedy actor yeah. I kind of wanted to move from one medium which is television and we've spoken in quite some detail about some of the roles and collaborations over the many years I wanted to now move to the the medium of a film of cinema and you've you've made several movies in your career and we can mention a few a private enterprise the hiding place quadrophenia the hit and many more how do you find the the filmmaking process from a actress's perspective and do you have any favorite films you've appeared in or filmmakers that you that you've worked for um I, I don't find that the the a lot of difference between tv and films nowadays you don't get any rehearsal for television you go on the set with your script and hope to you know maybe you have never met the actor before um, and God forbid you've got to get into bed with him if you have, if you haven't. Um, but, you know, it's been done. It's been done, believe me. Um, I, I mean, in, I, I tell you, now they have um, choreographers for sex scenes. They never used to. So the choreographer will be in the, in the scene saying, um, I, you know, you're in bed. Um, are you quite comfortable? All that. Well, we never had that you know, in the 70s and 80s. You just said, oh, this is so-and-so. Uh, your first scene is the bed scene. Get in. Um, and you just have to hope that everything was all right. But I've never had any trouble with anybody, any actor that um, I've had a bed scene with. And I've quite a few. Um, oh, yes, I tell, must tell you about um, Buster Keaton. No, not Buster Keaton. Buster Merrifield. Certainly not as old as Buster Keaton. Um, Buster Merrifield. Um, I was his first bed scene ever, and we did it for comic relief, and he was so lovely to work with. There's another great joy in, in my life. Um, we were in bed in the hospital, and um, he said to me, very quietly, he said to me, I know it's Red Nose Day, but he said, as you're my first bed scene, I brought you a red rose, and he was just, he was a joy. Um, but I just thought I'd throw that in because he's, he was such a lovely man and so sweet. And he said, look what I've got in bed with me. Look what I've got at my age in bed with me. He was so excited. Um, so that that was lovely. Uh, but back back to the um, the difference between film and, and TV. Well, nowadays, as I said, you don't you, you just have you don't have rehearsal in the old days. You'd have, you know, if it was a hours play for today you get two weeks rehearsal if it was half hour you get one week it's rehearsal and then and then you film but now it's just exactly the same you just walk on the set and, and the, the only the, difference now is you have a covid test before you get on there and the, the budgets between sort of feature film and now tv are almost identical aren't they millions are being plowed into huge tv shows and there's almost no difference from a, a kind of feature film to um a television production now it was almost kind of seen decades ago as kind of the poor person's medium compared to motion pictures but 
alas, that's that's changed completely now, hasn't it? And I think Netflix has changed it. I think Netflix has changed it enormously. I wanted to pick up on, you mentioned about the sex scenes, and I, I kind of wanted to ask your perspective on this, particularly as a woman, because you, you always said you felt quite comfortable, even though there wasn't a choreographer performing yeah. those scenes. But I kind of wanted to ask your perspective, because if we look at if we look at films like the Carry On films and the Confessions films, they're very much... Sorry, somebody's gone on. I don't know how this has come on. I'm going to turn it off. I'm oh, no so problem. Sorry. The TV was set, was it? Ah. Didn't do more. Now, how's that? How strange is that? I wonder. I wonder what I'd done for a minute, Linda. I thought your husband was in the background saying, "Oh, you can't answer that question." Um, no, it was, <laughs> no, no, was, no, he's, not. he's in another room watching Netflix. Uh, <laughs> no, but the television just turned itself on. I don't. It's a bit strange house. Probably my father. Good publicity there for um, for Netflix as well. Um, I was going to say that um, kind of looking back at those films, like the Carry On films and the Confessions yeah. films, they're very kind of typical of their their era, almost a postcard innuendo, and you know, yeah, very kind of, kind of kind yeah. of very smutty, I guess as well. Yeah, nowadays oh, very old fashioned, aren't they? Obviously now perceptions have, have changed and we kind of live in a, a different society and obviously mm. we kind of films are being censored for the jokes in regard to sexu sexuality um perceptions of women back in those times and race how, mm. how do you kind of perceive that yourself do you think do you think that's a positive change or do you think it's a regressive change what are your kind of thoughts um. Well, I mean, people are very afraid nowadays, aren't they? They're afraid, is it okay if we talk about this? Is it okay if we, you know, they're, they're just afraid because of, of so, well, I think we've gone over the top. That's what I really think. It's sort of probably what I'm trying to say. Mm. Um, it, it's never a bad thing to, to, to be cautious. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't complain. We get, I, you know, you'd, you'd get a pat on the bottom and somebody would say, come on the set, darling, you know. And no, I wouldn't mind it being called darling if somebody couldn't remember my name. And I I mean, you know, the odd pat on the bottom. I mean, probably nobody would whistle at me now, but you know, it's quite, I don't know. I think we've gone a little too far, but it's good. What is good is that there's a lot more room. There's more parts for women. There's more mm. women the other side of the camera and there are more women out there you know um fighting our our kind of fight for for women in film and that is excellent i'm very proud of that but you know careful does it is all i can say you know i'm i'm, I'm not too precious i wanted to come back to kind of some of the television shows you've worked on which we've we've mentioned Obviously, some of them have got strong fan bases. What does fandom mean to you? And is it something you embrace? And are you involved in the convention circuit? No, not 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 desperately. Um, I I mean, I've been to, I've been to a few, um, and because I I have a lot of um, followers, a lot of readers come come to conventions to get my books and get my books signed. Um, so I, I have been to a few, but I'm not, no, you know, I'm, I'm a busy working woman, so I don't have a lot of time, but I'm always happy to talk to anybody who's, you know, in, interested in, in, in stuff. Um, and I, I always reply to people that write to me. Um, and I, I'm thrilled if somebody, you know, likes my books or likes my work or in any way it's it's flattering for you know it is flattering we don't want to be out there in an, an abyss just doing our job and nobody taking any notice I, I, it's nice to know that people read my books and it's nice to know that people still remember the greats of the comedy greats I wanted to um this is kind of a good moment to talk about the transition in your career from being a a screen 
performer and working on the stage as an actress and then making the transition to becoming a writer. I wanted to ask you what made you decide to make that transition and what attracts you specifically to the crime genre and what were the challenges in getting your first novel published um, back in 2005? Mm. Oh, well, I've always written. Um, even if it was a diary as a child, poetry as a very young child, I did always write. Um, I, I wrote some short stories and stuff, um, won a couple of competitions with all that. Half of it was just really to think, oh, look, I can do it. The nuns, you know, and all that. And the teachers thought I was stupid. And um, But I've always enjoyed writing and, and it's something I would never stop doing. Um, I was writing, somebody once said to me, you should always write about what you know. And I was writing a book about pantomime because I have done a load of pantomimes in my life. Um, and then I had, I think we know this, in, uh, that I had an incident where I was kidnapped in my car um, at knife point and I had a very traumatic time over that. And then this crime, uh, this pantomime book that I was writing turned into somebody on the loose backstage a psycho the um, psychopath on the loose backstage and that's you know your mind working your your subconscious mind and i read it and i thought god this is dreadful really awful but obviously needed to get it off my chest mm. um so i threw it away in the um in in the recycling thing opposite where i live and Brian said, where's that? Um, what did you do with that pantomime book? And I said, oh, I threw it away. It was dreadful. He went, I really enjoyed it. Where is it? And I said, it's in the recycling bin. He said, I'm going to get it. And he went and got it. He ferreted it out and he sent it to um, uh, a company, the, the, a new publishing company, an, an embryonic publishing company who, who were looking for crime, new crime writers. Um, and it was a worldwide crime hunt and, and I won them and I won it and, and nobody more really nobody more surprised than me I know people say that but I was absolutely shocked um and my prize was a two book contract and I thought my goodness I, I, you know I always wanted to write comedy I thought I've actually got to write a second crime novel what will I do um so I cast my mind back finally we were talking about nudity because I set it in a strip club because daddy worked in a strip club as a comic and I went there as a child and I thought yeah it's a really good place you know to to um to set a, a murder so that was my um my second book which became a pick of the year in the observer and I couldn't believe that either and on it's gone from there really another wanted, one out in May I wanted to stick on the topic of writing of the novel you, of the novels you've written so far which one are you most proud of and why and secondly if you had to choose which of your careers is the most fulfilling what would you choose and for what reasons um i don't have a favorite with my books i always say people ask that and i would say could you choose a favourite with your children? You, you couldn't, could you? No, I mean, no, not at all. No, exactly. I, and I think most writers will feel that about their books because it takes so much love, blood, blood, sweat and tears to write the blooming thing. Um, and, you know, they become a bit like your baby and then you have to let them go and people start, you know, saying, oh, this, that and the other. Um, and, and you just have to let them go and, and, and as we have to let our children go. And so I don't have a favorite and I don't, um, my writing has made me a better actor because mm. I understand the whole story that the writer has written and where my character comes into that play. Um, as an actor, I'm a better, yes, I'm a better actor for that reason. And as a writer, I'm a better writer because I understand characters and I love writing different characters because I can play them all. I'm interested to, to now talk to you a little bit about the creative process of writing. I'm kind of interested because I was quite friendly, very friendly with quite a, a well-known writer. And he used to talk to me about 
how he comes up with his ideas and when he writes and what location he kind of uses to to write. How does the kind of process work for you? Is there kind of a, a set routine? Do you spend a set amount of hours or or does it change from novel to novel? How, how does it kind of work? Do you structure a book or do you kind of go in fresh or how does it I kind of work? I have absolutely no idea how I pull anything. I'm no one more surprised than me I get, when I get to the end of it. I don't, people, I, I did a master's degree when I, um, I had cancer. And when I had cancer and I was having chemotherapy, I wanted to get my brain ticking. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll do a master's degree in journalism. Um, but they talked about, when I did that, they talked about um, writing a book and how you must structure. You must structure, structure. And I used to think, God almighty. I do not. I mean, I just say, I, if I want to go on, if I'm on tour and I want to go to Glasgow, I could take 17 different routes. And I think the same in a book. I mean, you know, I may as well entertain myself because so I don't know what's going to happen in chapter three. I don't know. I don't I have no idea how it's going to end. And people say, well, at least you know who did it. No, I don't. Um, but that the, the, the person the murderer will always jump out at me when I start writing. They're the, well, I've always relied on that. It could stop tomorrow, so who knows? But um, you know, I, I don't have, and I don't have a discipline of writing. I must write from seven to 11 in the morning or what some people write all day. I just don't, you know, um, no, I, I, because I'm an actor as well and I do after lunch talks and all sorts of things. And, you know, I've got a husband who needs feeding. So, you know, I write when I write really. That's a lovely, uh, lovely answer. And it's interesting. I kind of, I feel the same way, almost the kind of the way I do things is kind of a bit of improvisation and kind of just doing it and living in the moment. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just, you just have to do it. You don't, yeah, you're thinking yeah. about, thinking about something is almost the, the worst thing you can do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I yeah. think it's fair to say that so far in our conversation, the, the tone of it has been very positive and it's your enthusiasm for what you do, whether it's writing or performance comes out in abundance, but I kind of wanted to turn to kind of some more difficult phases in, in your life, if you don't mind. And you briefly mentioned one and that was an incident that happened before the publication of your, your first book where you were kidnapped at knife point. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, can you recall what happened and how did you get over the ordeal and what were the what was kind of the eventual outcome from that? Well, um, the 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 main thing that should come out of it is that um, anybody listening to this who male or female, but probably more a uh, female lock your door when you get into your car lock your door i hadn't got my door locked um i didn't it never occurred to me and, and until then i would never go out now without locking my door and i never really go out at night without my dog um so uh, in that way i think i have got some scars um but i refuse to let anybody like that take over my life um yeah they were they they, they were caught and and um and imprisoned and um so yeah it, it sort of found its way through worked its way through really but lessons to be learned and I guess it was you know just part of my my path in life to, to write crime novels and not and not comedy I don't know maybe I'll still write my comedy I want to you obviously had that very tragic incident happen and you've also experienced health scares as well and I was going to ask you about about those as well and as a consequence of kind of this this incident that happened as well. Yes I'm a great believer that cancer comes from stress and a lot of um, consultants and doctors um, and experts that, that have spoken to me have, have all said the same don't get stressed about things blah. Um, my first cancer was not long after that um and it was quite a serious cancer because they hadn't um 
but it just, just I just hadn't really taken it seriously I hadn't so if anybody has anything any problems go to the doctor just go because you know it, 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 the longer you leave it the tougher it is and I had a very very tough journey in my first cancer very 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 tough and a lot of chemotherapy but then again something came out of that I went and did a master's degree which I didn't agree with any of the tutors but I did get you know I did that and all that so um, that that was that, and I, and I I actually lived through it. I mean, lots of people said I wouldn't, but I did. I'm still here now. Um, but then my when my mother died, um, I I got cancer. I a few months afterwards, I was having a very bad time, um, and I'm, I'm, my cancer came back. I I got another tumor. So. Um, but I, uh, I knew the signs and I felt ill and I went quickly and we dealt, it was dealt with quite quickly. So and I'm still here to tell the tale. Um, so I think that's okay. And now, but, and now years on from that experience and that ordeal, how, how are you now sort of in terms of your health and your, your fitness? Do you feel I'm fine. well and active day to day? Yeah. Yeah, really well. I feel fine. I do yoga. I do my still do my yoga um, three to five times a, a week, which has always been my love. My godmother was a yoga teacher, and um, I, I've always believed yoga, and I do believe that helped me get through cancer. Um, and and I have a dog, and I walk my dog uh, every, every day, and and I work like a lunatic because I enjoy it. Not not because I work work. It's not really work. It's um it's hobby, isn't it? Um, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm in fine fettle. Um, so what can I say? Hopefully I'm, I'm all right. I probably live to be 110 one time. Surprise everyone. I wanted I'll to, I, w I wanted to ask you as well, that when you go through, uh, the incident that you did, which we've spoken about also, a, a health scare that could have possibly resulted in the, the end of your, your life. Mm. Do you think it changes your perspective about the way you kind of perceive your life? And do you think it's kind of changed your philosophy? And do you think you've changed maybe as a, a person as a result of those experiences? Um, I don't think I have. I mean, someone once said to me, you know, that you're completely over cancer when you start bitching about people again in you know that you're working with and I thought I had to stare at them and I thought I've always tried not to do that I've always I, I honestly don't believe in being unkind um so I've, I've if I've tried never to feel like that and, and I, I don't feel like that now and if somebody does me down well I believe in that's their karma they'll get on with it I've I've obviously got enough karma of my own um but, but so I just no I'm happy I've got the most wonderful husband uh, we haven't spoken about Brian have we well, I met no, I was gonna that was gonna be my next question oh, okay. I was gonna move on to again a, a question in relation to your personal and private life and you married um actor Brian Murphy in 1995 Yes. I kind of rudely wanted to ask you, was that your first marriage or did you have yes. previous partners and long term relationships? Obviously, you must have done. But I wanted to ask how, how you met one another. Yeah. And, and secondly, I wanted to ask, is Brian a, a fanatical dog lover like yourself? Yes. Well, he has to be. <laughs> you go before the dog. Um, no, uh, the, what Brian and I met. Now, this is interesting because my best friend died, sadly, very sadly, died of cancer. And um, we used to sit in the hospice every night giggling because she was like that. And she said to me, I was going out with somebody she didn't like, quite rightly so. And she said to me, when I die, you'll know I've gone to heaven because the first thing I'll do is I will find you a man who's worthy of you. So I that was just lovely because... Leslie died on March the 8th and in May Brian and I started rehearsal on a play called Wife Begins at 40 opposite an actor called Brian Murphy um, and 
Brian and I met on the first day of rehearsals and the, the um, producer was there and he said to Brian, when he came in, Brian, I need to introduce you to your new wife. Uh, and Brian said, actually, I need a cup of tea first. So, but, um, so Brian and I met doing a play called Wife Begins at 40, where we played husband and wife. What, um, what, what kind of time period was this? This was in 1990. Mm, okay. So it's five years before we married. Um, so that's when we met. Um, we, we did this play and Brian would say, he, Brian said to me once, do you know, apart from Yutha Joyce, who was his, he played opposite for years, as we all know, in George and Mildred, the sitcom George and Mildred, he said, apart from Yutha Joyce, he said, I've never worked with anybody who I know how that they're, they're going to tie on the next line before they open their mouth. And I had thought the same about Brian with my father because I was, was so in tune with my father's comedy. Mm. Um, so we had this amazing working relationship and it was just a it was platonic working relationship. And at the end of the season, I thought, well, he's obviously going to ask me out because we get on so well. I mean, he didn't. So <laughs> I had to go and chase him. Um, so uh, that, that, that was it really. I went, I went um, he was rehearsing at Stratford East and um, I was on my way to Walthamstow Dogs to meet the girls for a night out. And I thought I'd pop into Stratford on the way and say hello. And he was looking out the window and he saw me and he came out. And um, I said, would you like to come to tea? And he said, yes, when? And I said, well, whenever you like. And he said, well, I'll come tonight. So I never got to Waltham Dogs and he's, he, I, he hasn't moved out yet. <laughs> he's still here. Oh, talking about that dead on cue, he's here. Do you want to say hello? Sure. Would you want to say hello? Sorry, just say a quick hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? You well? Yeah, I'm fine, I think. <laughs> Hopefully. Just thought we'd say good. hello to everybody, yes. Um, are you yes. having a good meet? Yes, we, we are. are. Yeah, yeah. Lots yeah. of problems. I won't interrupt. Okay. Oh, well, no, yeah. no problem. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, yeah. Maybe we'll do an interview sometime. Who knows? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. maybe yes. so, yeah. We'll do one with you. Awesome. Um, but thank you kindly. I was gonna gonna ask you, and probably not a timely moment to ask you, but before you met Brian and you were kind of at the peak of your career in say around the, the 70s, was it hard to kind of form relationships? Because obviously working in on film sets and TV sets, it's it's long and days and touring all over the place. You're surrounded by the, the same people on set, and obviously that must be difficult and I suppose there's that kind of professional and professional element about getting involved in relationships in the workplace was it was it kind of difficult for you do you think or um no um no. I, like, well yes I think that I, I mean touring we did lots of touring didn't we in those days you tour everywhere in different, different places Our touring was quite a lonely old um, this is, uh, uh, you did ask earlier, I did have a long relationship with um, a detective, funny enough. Um, so I was never one for going out and meeting guys and all that. Um, I, so I, I, I just got on with it really. And, and, and um, I was with, as I said, this detective, Ken, who lovely man. Um, and that was it. It was fine. I wasn't really looking. I've never been. I've never looked. I was never looking. I mean, Brian and I, neither Brian wasn't looking and I wasn't looking. We just fell in love, you know, to really. Like a lot that. of like like a lot of things. It just just yeah, happens, it doesn't happens. it? Life happens. Yeah. Leads on to my final question before we come on to the questions we ask every Your Take guest. We wrap the interview with 13 quick fire questions Linda Regan but before we do that I wanted to ask you how much has the performance industry changed during your career and what changes have you embraced and which are you not so keen on and then and then finally or let, and then finally of all the areas you've worked in television film stage writing radio as well which we've not touched on which is your preference and why? Um, well, the industry has changed enormously since um, I, I grew up in it, as we know. 
um, and, and I've now got to the age I have and, and seen a lot of changes in the industry. Um, the industry changed, I'm afraid, enormously uh, under Maggie Thatcher because she came in and lots of different things happened and we lost equity, we lost our union. Um, so that was a struggle and that, that gosh, that's going back to the 80s. Um, things have changed. Hours are longer now and then that's to do with the fact that we don't have equity. Um, commercials are very different. We don't get well, we get buyouts now, whereas we used to get a lot of residuals and that something we didn't talk about. I've done nearly 100 commercials in my life over the many years I've been around. Um, but we used to get um, repeats, but now we don't. We just get a buyout. So that's very different. As I said, the hours are much longer. Um, the worst thing for me, I'm tearing my hair out, whereas I even think about it, is self-tapes, Actors Unite. We, because since coronavirus, we, 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 all our auditions, they send us a script, we learn it, and we have to self-tape it and then send them in. So we, we have to be director, producer, cameraman, lighting man, actor, uh, prop man, um, and and we don't know really how the director wants you to be. We just have to guess it. And that's, I think, the worst change for me as a performer. I like, I like to meet a director and for them to say, Linda, can you give it to me like this? And then I, I hopefully do what they ask me to do, because that's what actors do. But I have no choice when I have, I just have to use my brain and hope it works. Um, which a lot of the time it doesn't <laughs> but um, so that's the changes I've seen as for my favorite um, well again you know pick your favorite child pick your favorite dog I can't it's very hard there are very different nice thing about radio is that you can get up in the morning and put your pajamas on and go into radio four and you don't have to do anything the thing about films and television is you have to be up at four o'clock in the morning and women always first into makeup room um, and you have to, you know, have early nights so you look okay the next day. Um, Theatre, well, I guess there's always the smell of the, the audience. I just love an audience. There's something about a live audience that I, I takes my breath away. Uh, I love working with a live audience. And, and, of course, in television, we used to have the camera and the live audience when you did a comedy because they wanted the laughter. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore. There's another change. We don't have the live audience. So they all have their, their ups and their downs. I've heard sort of actresses and actors claim that stage is kind of the, the hardest because obviously you're in front of a, a live audience in that particular moment. But I've always thought from kind of an actor's or actress's perspective that for me, film and TV seems quite difficult because there's no spontaneity. You're constantly, you know, doing one scene and then you cut and then you're jumping from scene to scene. Do you, do you find that kind of hard that, you know, that you're constantly, you know, doing one scene, then you cut in and jump into another scene. There's no kind of continual flow. Um, no, I think you get used to that. Yeah, uh, it's like you do all the filming before you do the studio work on a series. You'll go away filming, do all the filming, and then they slot that in as you do the studio work. And I think you get used to that. But there is, you're you're right. There definitely is something about the consistency of again, uh, go back to a play, you know, with in in the theatre, um, because you have the consistency, uh, and you, you you know you know how how the trail's going. You know where your character's been. It just, it's, you, you just have to concentrate more. You just have to concentrate and think, where was I then? Um, and if you don't concentrate, then you can make a mistake, but you just got to keep your mind on the job. Linda Regan, we move on to that moment in the interview. We do this with every single Your Take guest. We ask them 13 questions, uh, quick fire questions, just to end the interview. And it's kind of a little bit away from their career to find out favourite pastimes, things they like, things they don't like, favourite places. So here we go. Okay. Final questions. 
Don't okay. need to think about these in any sort of detail. Here we go. So, Linda, what would you say is your favourite pastime? Yoga. Interestingly, we talked so much about film and some of the films you've performed in, but I'm asking you now, what is your favourite film and why? Oh, um, I, th I, th I think my favourite film of all time, or well, one of them, is obviously many, um, is Clute, Jane Fonda's Clute. I loved it. I, I, I loved the writing. I, I loved the pace. Um, I loved Donald Sutherland. I love him as an actor. I love Jane Fonda as an actress. They worked together magnificently. Uh, I, I, I think that'll stay as one of my top films. I also go the opposite way, and I loved the film Grease. Just Do you know what? I find Clue an interesting choice because I am a huge fan of Hollywood cinema in the 70s. And Clue is a highly rated acclaimed film from that decade. But mm. I kind of almost feel that it kind of gets a little bit hidden away because if you kind of think of the 70s, people say The Godfather 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, Sting. Yeah, that you know, some of the kind of obvious choices like Jules, mm. you know, um, Taxi Driver, Deer Hunter, the list is endless. I think it's a great, almost, it's a little bit of a political kind of thriller as well, mm. with a, a woman who was top of her game, tremendous actress, Jane Fonda, um, and also um, an interesting advocate for political and social change as well, wasn't she? Totally. Yeah, totally. Ahead and I it. and I agree with you with Donald Sutherland, the big star in the 70s. And I thought he was a little bit of an underrated actor. Totally underrated. I thought he was he's a great actor. Great actor. From Donald Sutherland, Jane Fonda, and a great Alan Pecula film to now novels, books. Who is your favorite novelist? <laughs> God, that's too hard to answer. Um, I mean, whoever I'm reading at the time, I'm reading Janet Ivanovich at the moment. She makes me laugh a lot. Um, I, I, I love a good thriller. I love Anne Cleves. Um, there's so many. that I mean, I guess most of them are thriller writers because that's what the, the genre I, I tend to read a lot in. Um, they're, they're just, there's so many of them. Uh, Peter Robinson. John Harvey, I, I, you know, there's loads of them. And on the, su on the subject of crime, which has obviously been a focus of your own works, is there a particular crime novelist or a true life, real life crime writer that particularly inspires you and you enjoy their, uh, the content that they put out? No, I doesn't. Nobody, I, I mean, they will inspire me and I love reading them all, but um, I, I will only allow myself to inspire myself for, for my for good or for bad, for rich or for poorer, for better or worse. I will just, yeah, I, I have to inspire myself, really. I have to dig down and, and feel that fear that, I mean, obviously, my kidnapping helped me a lot with my crime writing. So, um, yeah, I'm inspired by my own fears. Over the, the last hour, we've talked about so many different things and career changes that you've made. But if you could have had a different profession and you've had many, what would it have been and why? Well, I'd like to be a detective. I like because I like to I like to get the birdies, make everyone feel better and put them in prison. Do you know what I kind of. I echo that. I would have loved to have been a private detective. I know someone who was a private detective and they told me stories and I think it, seem, it seems a fascinating area to, uh, to, to be working in. Yeah, yeah I, I like to be a murder detective. Who in life next, and I think I know who you're going to choose, has been your greatest inspiration? Of course you do, my father. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Um, we move on to newspapers. Always interested to hear the selection. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Well, Brian insists on the mail, having the Daily Mail because he likes the crossword. Um, I, I personally prefer the Guardian. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> 
Um, we talk food now. What is your favourite food? Well, vegetarian. Um, so a nice bean stew will do me fine. Thank you very much. This next one normally stumps most guests and they always struggle with this one. We always ask a favourite cultural icon. It could be an historical figure. It could be someone who was maybe a, a revolutionary figure, maybe someone in history. Who would you say is your favourite cultural icon? Uh, well, I, I think I'm going to have to say Marilyn Monroe because I played her. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to stick with that. She was a fascinating woman with a very, yeah. very tragic demise. Very tragic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel the same about Princess Diana, you know, but uh, I'm going to stick with Marilyn Monroe. And a very iconic woman who I think will be remembered for probably even more decades to come, maybe in a century century's time, we might still be talking about Marilyn Monroe and her impact in Hollywood. Definitely. Curse words. Some people hate to say curse words, but we always ask, what is your favourite curse word and why? Oh, I love them all. Um, well, I write them all, gosh, because I write about downtown villains. So I know everyone in, in, in the book. I mean, do, I mean, do you want me to, to, to say a few of my swear words? Yeah, by all means. You, um, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 go for I'm, it. I'm very good at fucking. I'm, I mean, you know, I'll fuck this. And I will always. And of course, I forget sometimes who I'm talking to. Um, so, no, yes, I, I'm afraid that's my Brixton girl coming out of me. My dad was a South London Cockney. So that happens when you work the clubs, you know. I swear like a trooper. The when I worked with Diane Langton and that's on, on that film, the Confessions film, also on, on the Carry On film, and um, she said to me, the first thing she said to me was, oh, "I've got to try and I've got to try and behave myself, haven't I? And not swear in front of you." I said no. <laughs> I was thinking the same about you. So um, yeah, there was, was a, a of, uh, there was a period around about probably the late nineties where whenever I'd switch on Channel Five. It would always be one of those confessions films on at about 10 o'clock at night. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, there'd always be one. Yeah. And they've made so many of them, didn't they? They made a lot, right? Yeah. I wonder if Kevin Asworth made a fortune because I didn't. But um <laughs> yeah. I, I got I got I got given the box set as a birthday present once. Wow. <laughs> and it's on, on my shelf, um <coughs> but somewhere next door alongside um next to sort of Tarkovsky and Kubrick and Orson Welles, so. <laughs> Maybe you should change your friends. <laughs> it's, it's in good company, you know? <coughs> with, so, with some of the great cinematic icons. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, right. We talk about travel. Um, I wanted to ask your favorite place or holiday destination. Isle of Wight. Okay, yeah, why the Isle of Wight? Well, Daddy worked there. Um, on a holiday camp and Brian was born there and we oh. go there every year and they're very very dog friendly. I wanted to ask now we haven't spoken about music at all who would you say is your favourite music artist or a band and do you have a favourite album and if so what is it? Oh um I, I I like, I love music. I, I, you know, it's one of those things that, that really lift you, isn't it? Um, I, I, um, Willie Nelson, uh, I like Dolly Parton. I like, I like Barry Manilow. I love a bit of, but I love, um, I'm going to say Bob Geldof, Bob Marlow, Bob Marley. Um, I, yeah, I think that's my favorite album, Best of Bob Marley. And, um Obviously, being a performer over your career, have you done any sort of song and dance and musicals? That's something we've not touched upon. Uh, well, um, my husband has got the most wonderful voice you've ever heard. He really has got a wonderful voice and he's pitch perfect. And I'm afraid I don't, he doesn't even like standing in church with me at the Christmas singing him, you know, carols. He was going, keep it down. <laughs> Just get, keep it down, will you? You're right. Um, so I'm not a good singer, I have to admit. Um, but I, I, I can dance. Um, uh, 
uh, we did a at the Royal Shakespeare Company. We, we did a musical. Um, I've done Stepping Out. That's a dance written by Richard Harris. It's a dance show. Um, yeah, you know things like that. Of where, where I've had to dance, and Jimmy Perry wrote one about. Um, and there was a lot of singing and dancing in that. And um, he was on a budget and he said, well, would you join in with the chorus and do all the chorus numbers as well? So I was hoofing around in that. Um, I've done, yeah, I've done a few. We, we move on to the, the final two. Firstly, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Um, uh, Oh, I don't, believing in myself, believing in myself. Yeah, if anybody's listening to this, believe in yourself. And the final one, Linda Reagan, quite a deep question. How do you wish to be remembered? Um, oh, I'd like people to, I think I'd like to touch your heart whether it be, uh, you know, as a performer, as a writer, or as a friend. I've really enjoyed the, the last 60 minutes. It's been, for me, a, a fun conversation, and it I kind of reminisced about a lot of the performances you've been in and, and films, because they've, they've struck a chord with me. But it's just been um, a really nice, open and honest um, conversation we've had and the thing that I've kind of been touched upon is just your enthusiasm and love for what you do but also a lot of the positivity and love for the actual people you've worked with whether they've been performers writers cameramen directors it's certainly shone through in the interview um, good that's just been bless them thank you um I kind of like the fact about you've spoken about living in the moment and about spontaneity and there's been moments in tonight where there's been some good spontaneity hence the television hence your husband um entering the room and and speaking to me as well so I've really enjoyed it and it's been really interesting your perspectives on your careers what what you've done and the things that have happened in your life thank you and I just wanted to ask if people want to find out more about your TV, your film, your stage work and, and the writing, where My do book. they go? And the shows as well. Yes, um, I've got a website. It's www. And it's lindareganonline.co.uk. And Linda, to, to end up on, I wanted to wish you all the very best in the future, whether it's in front of the camera, maybe it's behind the camera with your writing, or obviously something creative. I wish you all the very best. And thank you kindly for sharing your story, your journey for this episode of Your Take. Thank you for your time. And I wish you well in the future too. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Mm -hmm.